Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 128. Today, we are going to be talking about the DC sniper shootings, which honestly, I feel didn't get enough coverage um, really when it happened. And there's not many documentaries about it. We don't learn about it really in school. So a lot of people don't know the details behind it if you're younger. Yeah, I had never heard of it, to be honest with you. You'd never even heard of it? I had never even heard of it until, you know, we started talking about it. And obviously, I've seen some things about it online, but I've never really like deep dived into it. I had no idea that it happened, you know, shortly after 2001 and 9-11 and all that. So I had no idea that this happened that soon after and yeah, I was how crazy like, this was what first second grade maybe yeah we were third. definitely pretty young yeah i don't remember it really at all i just have heard the name a few times but um it's really really interesting i think you guys are going to find it interesting so we have a lot to get into today we, and we do have a lot of intro topics as well we do a lot of things have been happening specifically in the crime world this mm-hmm. week um, and to start it off the first story we're going to talk about is Michael Turney was arrested. Huge news. And oh, didn't we need some good news in 2020? Seriously. Yeah. I was so happy to hear this. Um, this is major, major development. A lot of you probably know about this case. I know so many true crime, you know, podcasts and YouTubers have covered it. I've covered it on my channel. We've covered it on Mile yeah. Higher multiple times. We've had Sarah on the show twice, and she's a good friend of ours. So we are so, so happy that due to all of her hard work, yeah. um, you know, we've talked about how she's really wrangled this new audience on TikTok of younger people. And that has been really helping push the police, having so much traction online. And it's because of Sarah. I mean, she's reached out to so many people. She's gone on so many podcasts. She works her ass off. And then she started her own podcast as well, Voices for Justice, about her sister and everything that has happened in their lives. It is a fascinating case. It really, really is. And after all this time, Michael Turney has finally been arrested, which I didn't think we would even see this happen. Yeah, I I don't think anybody did, and Sarah included. I think, you know, he was going to just go to his grave, and, you know, we never know whatever happened to Alyssa Turney. And if you don't know what we're talking about specifically, so... Sarah Turney's sister, yes, sorry, <laughs> Alyssa Turney disappeared at 17 years old yes. and basically vanished without a trace. Mm-hmm. And all signs and evidence point to her father, Michael Turney, mm-hmm. having done something to Alyssa um, because she's no longer with us or, you know, we have no clue what happened to her. Yeah. So, he claimed that she ran away, but years later, um, Sarah really started kind of putting the pieces together and you know now here we are and she's really had to push the police to get this Um, yeah absolutely i mean if you want a real in-depth dive sarah's podcast is absolutely amazing she goes from start to finish there's so much so much to this case and so much to michael turney to really unravel this man that has a bunch of just crazy Mm -hmm. you know different things that he's done and and events and yeah it's a it's a truly crazy story but i'm just so happy for sarah and her family that you know, justice is, is coming for Michael Turney. Yeah, I, I am too. I mean, when she first texted me, I couldn't even believe it. I was like, what, you know, like he's arrested, but is there charges? Like what's the catch here? But yeah, he's fully being charged second degree murder. Yeah. yeah. yeah, I mean, that's definitely serious and they clearly have enough to indict him on that. So there's something there, you know, there's obviously evidence Mm -hmm. there and let's hope they convict him. So yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. He was actually made his first court appearance last Friday on the 21st of August, and he is scheduled to be back in court this coming Friday on the 28th. And uh, he's trying to get his bond reduced, but a judge denied that already. Good. So, you know, that it sounds like they're not going to let him out of jail uh, no. before the trial. So good thing. Yeah. And it's just so awesome to see because he's always told Sarah, I'll confess on my deathbed. Like he said weird shit like that to her and like almost admitting to it, but not. And it's just been such a mental struggle for her. I know Um, her family has been really broken up over this and it's, you know, she's dedicated her life to it. So it's just so awesome to see that if enough people speak out, if there's enough people signing petitions and using hashtags and supporting a victim's family member, then amazing things can happen. And it makes me just so proud of the true crime community as a whole. Because, yeah, not that many people knew about Alyssa's case before Sarah really started pushing it out there and, you know, making 
her voice heard. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like Sarah could write the guidebook for how Seriously. to get justice for your for your loved ones and you uh -huh. know in cold cases because I mean she really has done everything exactly the way it needs to be done in order to get the police to take things seriously, to stay on them, mm -hmm. to raise public awareness. Cause like she always tells us, you know, the police told me go, you know, go get more eyes on this, go get more yeah. awareness. And she's like, all right, I will. And that's exactly what she did. And, and look what happened. It worked. She's gotten it billboards, worked. raised money. I mean, it's just so cool to see this victory for yeah. her. And, and I hope, and I'm sure she hopes that it inspires other people to do the same, you know, like, it has you know, already. get out there and fight as hard as you possibly mm -hmm. can and get as many people as you possibly can to, mm -hmm. you know, get on your side and get behind you and support you and, you know, help spread the word. I mean, get the word out there. Cause like you said, if enough people rally around a cause and this could be, you know, you could apply this to a lot of other different types of situations and fields as well, where, you know, it, the power of the people is real. Yes. And if the people stand together and especially against, you know, the criminal justice system or the government and, you know, we want change, you can enact change. Oh, you absolutely can. And this is just proof of it. It's so inspiring. It really is. So and again, I mean, she's just at the start of another journey now though. Like yeah. trial's going to be really hard on her. I know she's emotionally so overwhelmed right now and doesn't even, I mean, so many things must be going through her head. Um, it is her father. It's yeah. a very dicey situation. So, um, we wish her the best of luck. We know that she will do the best that she can. She's a friend of the show. We'd love to have her back on anytime and Absolutely. hear updates on this. Absolutely. So that was just, yeah, we just want to share the, the wonderful news. So the next story is something we talked about, I think, a few weeks ago. We did. Um, or maybe it was even like a month ago or so. But It was back in June, actually. God, where the time just flying. I know. I'm like, back <laughs> back a few weeks ago. I know. Since the, the pandemic started, time's been like this weird thing yeah. I can't make sense it's of It's like anymore. slow motion sometimes, and sometimes it's like just whizzing by. So. I know. It feels that way. But um, yes, we saw this actually the day it was posted. We were just scrolling TikTok, and I came across this, and you I showed it to Josh. You are scrolling TikTok. Let's, yeah. But <laughs> you lay there with me in bed and look at my TikToks. Yeah, okay? but... I, I so don't you enjoy it. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this was very interesting though. This TikTok. Uh -huh. You showed, thought it was fake at first actually. Yeah. Well, because I think there's a lot of people on TikTok that are faking oh, pranks yeah. and shit like that on there to get no, views. There and, are. So this was kind of wild because these two teenagers were using that Randonautica app, which I think we've talked about, which is a very interesting concept in itself. Random points, you know, in the it's quantum like a, quantum field, and you know, it creates little coordinates to go to based upon your intention. And yeah. apparently, based on this app, these teenagers ran across a suitcase. I think it was like what on the uh, at a beach or something. Yeah, like just on a bunch of rocks near uh, some water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was in Seattle. And so they went to the suitcase and they opened the suitcase up and it mm -hmm. appeared that there was two, there was human remains and bags inside of it, I believe. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I don't know if they like manifested to see something yeah, scary like, or cause that's what a lot of people do with the app. They like yeah. try to think of something and then it's supposed to lead you to what you're thinking about. Um, so at first it did seem kind of staged and like what the hell, but the bags, I mean, it was like tightly packed in there and looked like, a serious, you know, setup almost. It didn't really look like someone, it was a prank. It looked very real to me from the beginning. Um, but yeah, we found out who was in those suitcases recently and we found out the details behind it very recently. Yeah. So the King County medical examiner's office confirmed the identities of the bodies as Jessica Lewis, who's 36 and her boyfriend, Austin winner, who was 27. And apparently uh, it was their landlord a 62 year old landlord named Michael Dudley uh, is being charged with murder after allegedly murdering the couple over unpaid rent. That's unbelievable. And then God putting in their bodies in suitcases. Talk about anger issues. Yeah. That, that's what scary. The hell Jesus just kick them out. Cause apparently back on June 9th, which was 10 days before the, the suitcases were found, uh, neighbors heard gunfire and yelling from inside the house and they actually called 911 and on the night of, of the murder, a man was reportedly heard yelling by uh, somebody who witnessed uh, what was going on. Please don't do this. Just let me leave Yeah. before they heard gunshots uh, fire out. So yeah, wow. that's really tragic, man. That's really sad. People who knew them said that they're really good hearted people and they'd been together for eight years. 
Yeah. I just don't really understand sad. what's wrong with people. Why are you murdering people over unpaid rent? That's when you have serious, yeah, anger problems. Yeah, seriously. So yeah, really, really sad, but hopefully, I mean, hopefully they convict this guy for, for the murder of, of those two. Cause that's just, mm-hmm. that's just terrible. But the last story that we have for you guys, and I actually heard about this on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, actually, and it's about a man named Derek Harris, who's from Louisiana, and he was actually arrested in 2008 for selling 0.69 grams of marijuana to an undercover police officer. What's crazy about this story is that not only was this guy a war veteran, uh, he fought in Desert Storm and in the Gulf War. When he got back, he you know started using marijuana and other substances, I guess. Mm-hmm. But after he did this, he sold that marijuana to the undercover officer. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison That's for this crime. But then what's even crazier is that in 2012, he was resentenced to life imprisonment under the Louisiana's habitual offender law. What the fuck? Something that I can just go down the street right now, 0.5 yeah. miles from my house and buy legally. Yep. What the hell? And, and his habitual offender uh, issue was just due to substance abuse, which he's a war veteran. When veterans come back, they're dealing with all sorts of issues physically and mentally. So he's trying to medicate himself. And yet all of this cost him getting a life sentence in prison because judges in Louisiana are allowed to enact harsher sentences for habitual offenders. So yeah, he was sentenced to life in prison for a tiny amount of weed. It's crazy. It's absolutely insane. That really is. Yeah. I was going to say those who aren't familiar with like, kind of like what the measurements are for cannabis 0.69 grams is a minuscule amount. Like it is mm-hmm. such a small amount. It's like worth like nothing. nothing. Like, yeah, I don't even know, like five, 10 bucks probably, I guess, depending on where you live, but I'm just saying it's tiny, 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 tiny amounts. And it's insane that that was even it's like a nug. Life it's, it's literally like a nug. Mm-hmm. It's insane how small it is. And the f- plant. <sighs> For the fact that he's going, you know, supposedly he was supposed to go to jail for the rest of his life. Are you kidding? That's fucking absurd, really. But the good news about this is that the Innocence Project, which if you've ever heard of that, they got behind this and they're the ones that actually got him freed. Uh, He was he was freed uh, recently. So because, yeah, Joe Joe Rogan had the guys that started the Innocence Project on a show. Oh, cool. And they were talking about this case with him and stuff. Check that out. And yeah, it was really interesting to hear like and this guy's now been released. But the problem is now is that as with many people that are released from prison is that they have nothing no job. They have Mm -hmm. a criminal. I mean, he's still going to have that criminal record just because he's released doesn't mean that doesn't follow him. Totally screwed. And he has no money. So now he's like, what am I supposed to do now? And he's in a really bad situation. So there's actually a GoFundMe and we'll, we'll link it for you guys. If you're interested in, in helping out Derek, I'm sure he'd really appreciate it. He's trying to get back on his feet. And yeah, the, this is a, a absolutely great example of the failures of our criminal justice system and why we need reform, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to uh, substance abuse and yes. just people getting ridiculous sentences for uh you know, drugs and and other substances. It's just insane that we're even dealing with this still in 2020. I know over such small amounts too. Meanwhile, there's people doing violent ass shit that are getting, I know not life in prison for things, you know, they're doing carjackings. I mean, we've talked about a number Mm -hmm. of different cases on here where they get, you know, slap on the wrist and they're back out doing more violent acts. And meanwhile, our, our prisons are just overflowing with people in there for uh, substance of, substance charges and drug There's charges so many private prisons that are just making money off them people that are basically enslaved working for nothing yeah just because of these it's really bad man charges it's like i really take hope their whole life yeah it's it, it, crazy it, i can't even imagine how they feel every day i would be so depressed i can't even imagine getting through the day or waking up yeah yeah over I mean, something so dumb over one thing over a plant literally yeah. a plant that's sick it's especially a plant I'm like really a natural plant that grows out of the ground and you're going to spend your life rotting in prison over that. The fact that people in general can even get a life sentence for something nonviolent is insane. I don't care Mm -hmm. how many Mm -hmm. nonviolent crimes you've committed. It's still nonviolent. I'm sorry, but yes, life in prison, you're supposed to go in prison. Prison Mm -hmm. was made for to, you know, hold people who are dangerous to society. If you're doing nonviolent crimes, I just think it's ridiculous that that was that the, even a possibility, it blows my mind. And compared to other countries that have yeah. legalized 
pretty like some countries have legalized everything yeah. and yep. their crime rates are record low. Yep. Uh, Portugal is one of them. I believe they have uh, all drugs are legal there. Isn't Norway too? Uh, I don't know, think it's I Norway. Think there's a, that. there's a few countries out there that I think there's a, a central American country as well, or it's South, a South American country. But I was just thinking too, like you guys on the SES just covered uh, the school, like the school system and problems and yeah, we did comparing it to Around the world. like Finland and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, when you uh, you brought up that where to invade next by mm-hmm. Michael Moore, yeah, and Excellent. I can't remember. I think one in that favorites. one he shows prisons too, in that mm-hmm. doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. he looks at everything. He yeah. just goes around and looks at other countries and what we could take from them. And where to invade basically means like America's going to come in and steal yeah. their good ideas, a, but yeah. we never do. Yeah, because uh, we're dumb. Well, <laughs> on, huh? on that note, it just showed like in, in that in that documentary, he goes to I forget what country he's in. I think it's like Norway or something like that. It's, That's what I was just saying. Norway. It's one of those Norwegian countries up there, but he goes to I one of the prisons. Norway. Yeah, and these violent offenders who've murdered people yeah. and like raped people and all this other stuff mm-hmm. are literally being rehabilitated there. They're not mm-hmm. in these tiny cells. They've got like little dormitories and they're cooking and they're cleaning and they're they're, they're allowed doing to use knives yeah. and cook yeah. if they're mm-hmm. trusted enough. Yeah. They're they trust being them to taught. rehab. Exactly. To go back into society right. so you can mm-hmm. be a functioning adult. So you don't have to be like poor Derek who is now in the streets with no, yeah. you know, yeah. no tools Just to screwed. use. Okay. Exactly. So you're not in jail. Now what? Right. Yeah. No, they want their citizens to actually get better and come back into society. And so their crime rates are, are lower. Their prison rates are way lower. Yeah. And Meanwhile, our, our prisons are like factory farms. Yeah, we treat people like trash. <sighs> so just many problems in America. <laughs> and you know, some people out there, like I, there are killers that I just deserve. I feel like yeah. deserve to be in solitary confinement. Fuck them. They're mm-hmm. al- I don't care if at, like rats are eating them alive, honestly. Right. But there's just so many people in there for the most ridiculous things that can easily be rehabbed that, you know, there is to a level degree of mistakes that happen. Yeah. And, yeah, it's it's a shame that our even, system doesn't try to do that. Yeah, well, even the, there's a Netflix show that's really good. I am a killer, I think is what it's called. Mm. And I've watched a few episodes of that. And, and even those people who murdered people, uh, a lot of them did it when they were young, really yeah. young. Uh, we'll actually kind of be talking about that today with the DC snipers mm-hmm. uh, about what happens if a juvenile kills somebody? Do they mm-hmm. deserve to be in prison for life? A lot of people think so, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's a very controversial opinion. I feel like whenever I speak out on sentences like that, especially I've I've talked several times on my channel about children who have gotten who have killed someone when they're kids because mm-hmm. they have some crazy shit going on in their life, and then they you know go through prison and they're rehabbed and they have these life sentences, or they were tried as adults. Which I just don't understand. If you're not an adult, you shouldn't be tried as an adult. I don't. Under, I don't get that. Yeah, yeah, and th- and that's the thing is that, I mean, that's a whole debate. I guess we could go into another yeah, time. But I guess we're getting off topic. But but I, at the end of the day, I just think that you know it's so obvious. We keep hearing stories of of people like Derek who are just you know wrongfully imprisoned and given sentences that just are inhumane. To be honest with you, because mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if any of you watch you know, 60 days in, or you watch any of these prison, you know, locked up and and you see the state of our prison system and you just, it's literal torture in there. It is. And again, I'm not saying not everybody deserves to, you know, be rehabbed and stuff. People have done heinous things, obviously need to pay, pay the price for that. But there are a lot of people like Derek who are just, you know, either made a bad decision or, you know, dealing with substance abuse or, you know, nonviolent charges that just shouldn't be in prison for life. So, Mm -hmm. We're happy for Derek and and hopefully he can, you know, get back up on his feet and try to enjoy the rest of his life. Yeah, definitely. But with all that being said, let's go ahead and get into the DC sniper shootings. This is an absolutely crazy case. But before we do, we'd like to thank our first sponsors for today. During these economically turbulent times, everyone is looking for a way to feel more financially secure, right? So if you're still needlessly throwing money every month at high interest credit card debt, it's time you checked out Upstart, the revolutionary online lending platform that knows you're more than just a credit score. Now's the time to find out how low your upstart rate can be to help pay off high interest credit card debt. Unlike other lenders, Upstart can reward you based on your education and job history in the form of a smarter rate. You don't need a degree or a diploma to apply though. But it's important to remember that your loan amount will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application, and not all applicants will qualify for the full amount. Over 400,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards or meet their financial goals, so free yourself. 
from the burden of high interest credit card debt and get back to using your money your way with Upstart. See why Upstart has a 4.9 out of 5 rating on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash mile higher to find out how low your Upstart rate can be. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. So I first tried Third Love bras a few years ago, actually, and I have not worn anything but Third Love bras since. They are the best bras. I truly feel that way. Third Love does bras differently. They believe that every woman deserves to feel comfortable and confident every day. With the right kind of support, they will help you do this. They have over 80 bra sizes, which is a lot, but they know that only one matters to you, and that is yours. All you got to do is answer a few simple questions in their Fit Finder quiz, and it only takes about 60 seconds. Over 15 million women have taken that quiz to date. Also, we love Third Love because they give back. They donate all of their gently used return bras to women in need, and they also support charities in their local San Francisco Bay Area and across the United States. Third Love knows that there is a perfect bra out there for everyone, so right now they are offering our listeners 15% off your first order. All you got to do is go to thirdlove.com slash mile higher and find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash mile higher for 15% off today. So today we're going to be talking about the DC sniper attacks, but we're also going to be talking about obviously the perpetrators of these attacks. And that was John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo. So with any of these types of events or, you know, serial killers and just, I mean, really any criminal in general, I think it's always important to go back and look at kind of where they came from and try to understand their background and see, see if there's anything in their history that can kind of help explain maybe how, how they end up doing such a Mm -hmm. a evil act later on in their life. And maybe there's, you know, some way to get some understanding around it. I think it helps to, to have that information. So I do too. So let's go ahead and start with John Allen Muhammad. So John Allen Muhammad was born John Allen Williams on December 31st, 1960 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and his parents were Ernest and Eva Williams. Now, when John was just a toddler, his mother Eva was diagnosed with breast cancer, and because of this, the family moved to New Orleans. Unfortunately, his mother died shortly after when John was only three years old, and what's even worse is that after his mother died, his father Ernest left John to be raised by uh, basically his aunt and his grandmother. He graduated high school in the late 1970s and married a woman named Carol Kagler before joining the Louisiana Army National Guard as a combat engineer in 1978. He had a thriving career in the military and John and Carol had one child, a son named Lindbergh. John was well liked by his colleagues and seemed to have a happy, normal home life. But by the early 1980s, everything started to fall apart. John had some issues in the military. He was actually disciplined for failing to report for duty. He hit rock bottom when he assaulted a fellow officer. So he showed anger issues early yeah, on. Yeah, that's not a good good look for sure to mm-hmm. start fighting with your fellow uh, soldiers in the army. That's definitely a no-no. And he also wasn't getting along with Carol because they split up in 1985 and he transferred to the U.S. Army in November where he had a prosperous career. He worked his way up from mechanic to truck driver, eventually was a metal worker, and then became a skilled sharpshooter. And he even earned his expert marksmanship badge. During his time in the Army, John served in the Gulf War and received three service medals in recognition of his military service. He also met his second wife, Mildred Green, and had three more children. We'll be talking about Mildred more. Yes. Yeah, Mildred becomes a a key piece in this uh, Mm -hmm. case for sure. So then in 1987, John decided to join the Nation of Islam. And at the time, the nation was led by Louis Farrakhan, who worked to turn it into an international political movement and encourage social and economic reform in black communities. So after John's pretty successful career in the military in the U.S. Army, he was honorably discharged on April 24th, 1994, and he received several more rewards recognizing his service. And then over a year later, on October 16th, 1995, John participated in the Million Man March as part of the event's security team. So this march was organized and led by the Nation of Islam, Farrakhan, and several other civil rights organizations with an emphasis on making issues facing the black community part of the national political agenda. 
But this event was skewed and Farrakhan was criticized by black Christians and the Jewish community for being anti-Semite. And the march was criticized for leaving black women out of the event. So pretty much after this march and for the rest of the 90s, John just continued uh, having a string of bad luck. Two businesses he owned, a mechanic shop and a karate school failed. And his second wife, Mildred, filed for divorce in 1999. So their divorce was a messy divorce. And I believe John even threatened to kill Mildred at one point, And she had to get a restraining order against him. Yes. Uh, he he kind of snapped. He was very abusive to her just in general, to mm-hmm. both of the wives that he had had. So after Mildred took out a restraining order on him, He responded to this by kidnapping their children and taking them to Antigua, an island in the West Indies, and committing both credit card fraud and immigration document fraud in the process. While John was living in Antigua, he met an underage Jamaican immigrant named Lee Boyd Malvo. So here's a little background on Lee. Lee was born on February 18, 1985, and his mother, Una James, worked as a seamstress, and his father, Leslie Malvo, was a mason. His parents never married, but they lived together as a family in Kingston, Jamaica. When Lee was five years old, his life was uprooted, and Una left Leslie and took her son to live in Endeavor, Jamaica, with her sister, Maria Lawrence. Lee would then spend the next several years moving from place to place with no long-term stability. Una and Lee stayed with Marie for almost a year before moving back to Kingston. Una then moved her son to St. Martin, only to send him to live with his Aunt Maria for a year when he was just nine years old. So he's just getting bounced around a lot, which for a young child definitely makes it harder for development and just for, you know, social skills and making friends and all that kind of thing. So as a kid, Lee was antisocial and had trouble making friends. He was sometimes found torturing small animals he had caught, and he liked playing violent video games. When he was in sixth grade, Lee was accepted into the prestigious York Castle High School after scoring exceptionally well on his entrance exam. And then when he was 14 years old, Lee was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is a strict denomination of Christianity known for living modestly and adhering to a rigid code of ethics. By then, Lee's mother had relocated to Antigua, and he moved there to be with her in 1999. He then went to attend the Antigua and Barbuda Seventh-day Adventist School, and he did well in his classes and extracurricular activities, even winning an award for running the 100-meter dash. Lee's world would change for the worse when he met John Muhammad in October of 2000 in an electronics store. And when the two met, they hit it off and they became fast friends. In January of 2001, Lee moved in with John. And then later that year, John helped Lee's mother, Una, move to Florida to find work using false documents to allow her to enter the country. Lee ended up staying with John for several months. And by March, John had already persuaded Lee to convert to Islam. Lee then joined his mother in Miami later that year, also using false documents. It was also around this time that John ended up moving with his three children to Bellingham, Washington. And when the police found him, they returned the children to their mother and the couple battled for custody in court. Mildred ended up winning full custody of all three kids and then moved them to Maryland, far away from John, so to the D.C. area. In October of 2001, John officially changed his name to John Allen Muhammad from John Allen Williams. And that same month, Lee ran away from his mother's home in Florida to find John in Washington. And then Lee's mother, Una, eventually joined her son in Bellingham, Washington. In December of 2001, they were arrested by Border Patrol. Lee was detained until January 2002 when he was released on a $1,500 bond. And he went straight to Bellingham to find John. For a while, the two of them were living in a homeless shelter together. And John became sort of a father figure to Lee. Lee attended Bellingham High School, and John was posing as his father at the school, actually. And according to a lot of people, they said that he would call him father as well. Yeah, yeah. They had, they definitely had Sometimes. that relationship. Yeah. yeah, they did. John isolated Lee from other people and didn't allow him to make any new friends at his school. So super controlling. And he also implemented abusive tactics to control him, such as forcing him to adhere to extreme diets. Like he would only allow him to eat crackers and honey all yeah. day and he would have to do these really crazy exercise programs. Yeah. And I think that he would have them fast too all the mm-hmm. time as well. Mm-hmm. John's role model was Osama bin Laden. Really great figure too. Yeah. Seriously. Your role model. That explains so much. I feel like. Yeah. Uh, so he believed that the September 11th terrorist attacks were admirable and justified. Yeah. Can you Clearly. believe that? 
<sighs> man. So sick in the head. And what's even worse is that he ended up teaching Lee these beliefs and kind of in a way brainwashed him into mm-hmm. believing that Osama bin Laden was this good guy. And you know what he did was, you know, right. He then convinced Lee that they could extort money from the government to get back at them and start a Canadian camp for homeless black children. John claimed that this camp would be used to train the next generation of young terrorists and create a new nation of pure black youth. The ultimate goal was to shut things down in the U.S. John and Lee both owned guns, even though neither of them were legally allowed to have them. As an expert marksman, John taught Lee how to shoot a Bushmaster XM-15, which is an AR-15 style rifle that Lee had stolen from a gun store in Tacoma, Washington. Yeah, it's basically a military weapon, uh, pretty Scary. much. Yeah. So John and Lee did a ton of target practice with each other. And Lee would even set up paper plates as targets. And he they would say that they'd use them to represent human heads. And what's even crazier is that they would practice shooting at the very gun range that they stole this uh, Bushmaster rifle from. Which I don't know how that worked out exactly, but uh, that's pretty ballsy to do that. Yeah. John and Lee also practiced shooting at a tree stump in a friend's yard. And the ultimate goal for John was to make sure Lee was as skilled of a marksman as he was before they moved on to even worse and more evil things together. It didn't take long for these two to move on from target practice to real victims. From February to September 2002, John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo injured multiple people and murdered at least seven others in various shootings. Kenya Nicole Cook was visiting her uncle and aunt that day, Issa Nichols, on February 16, 2002, when she was shot and killed at their front door. Issa was close friends with Mildred Green, John's second ex-wife, and had urged her to divorce him. So she may have been the primary target, but John sent Lee to carry out the shooting as a test, and he murdered Issa's niece, Kenya, instead. Ruthless, man. Yeah. Clearly... And, and this is kind of a, a theory that develops over the course of this whole case is uh, surrounding around John's ex-wife, Mildred Green. Yes. And clearly he wants her dead. He was very, very angry at her, hated her. And he was willing to kill innocent random people mm-hmm. in order to get to her. It didn't matter. Mm-hmm. In March of 2002, John took a trip to Tucson, Arizona to visit his sister, and it was his turn to kill. On March 19th, 60-year-old Jerry Taylor was practicing his golf shot at a nearby course when he was shot in the chest and killed. It had been a long range shot, and he never saw it coming. That's so scary. Just enjoying your day. I know. That's the thing that's so scary about this case is it's all people who, I mean, you don't even know if they know It wasn't like you're a target. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I mean, chances are they had no idea what hit them. Because it was just out of the blue. Yeah. They're normally doing something else. They're not looking. Mm Mm-hmm. Months later, on August 1st, Lee spotted 51-year-old John Gaeta while he was changing his tire in a parking lot in Hammond, Louisiana. Lee shot him in the neck, and John went down quickly as the bullet exited his back. Lee actually got close enough to steal his wallet while John was playing dead, not realizing how injured he really was. After Lee left, John Gaeta ran as fast as he could to the nearby gas station to get help. He didn't realize he was bleeding until he stopped running. But he got lucky. The bullet didn't hit any vital organs or arteries, and he was released from the hospital within an hour of being admitted. That's super lucky. That is. In September, John and Lee traveled towards Washington, D.C., metropolitan area, and they killed and wounded several people throughout this month. But it's not clear which one of them was the gunman in each situation. So at 1030 p.m. on the evening of September 5th, 55-year-old Paul LaRuffa was locking up his restaurant, Margelina, in Clinton, Maryland. Paul had bought the place in the mid-1980s and transformed it from a pizza shop to a full-menu family Italian restaurant. As Paul was locking up his restaurant for the night, he was unfortunately shot six times at close range and killed. His laptop and $3,500 were also stolen. And then, a few minutes after 10 p.m. on September 14th, 22-year-old Rupinder Oberoi was shot outside Hillendale Beer and Wine in Silver Spring, Maryland. He was injured but survived. The next night, about 30 miles away in Brandywine, Maryland, 32-year-old Muhammad Rashid was shot while locking up Three Roads Liquors. He was injured but also survived. 
Two separate shootings occurred on September 21st, 2002 as well. Around 12.15 in the morning, 41-year-old Million A. Woldermerriam was at Sammy's Package Store in Atlanta, Georgia, helping the owner close up shop. He was shot with a 22 caliber pistol in the back and head and killed as a result. John and Lee quickly moved on to Montgomery, Alabama, where they robbed a liquor store around 7 p.m. on September 21st. There were two workers inside the store at the time, 52-year-old Claudine Parker and 24-year-old Kelly Adams. Kelly was shot in the neck and seriously injured, but she did survive. Claudine was shot in the chest and unfortunately died at the scene. At the crime scene, police found a brochure that they believed had been dropped by the shooter and were able to lift a fingerprint from it, luckily. The last of these random shootings took place on September 23rd in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Around 6.30 p.m., 45-year-old Hong Im was shot once in the head with a Bushmaster rifle and died instantly. I mean, when you're shot in the head with something like that, there's just no chance you're going to survive that. No, absolutely not. Two additional deaths and several more injuries have been linked to John and Lee, taking place between March and July 2002. On March 25th, they also stole a Bank of America Platinum credit card from a Greyhound bus driver in Arizona. So it's pretty obvious that John and Lee were just going around Mm -hmm. doing random attacks. There's no real rhyme or reason as to why they were killing these people or trying to kill these people uh, that they were. And it Mm -hmm. seems like they were just trying to kind of spread spread out these attacks all over the place uh, mm-hmm. in, in an attempt to, I think, create an illusion of a serial killer. I guess they really are serial killers. I mean, they're yeah, I mean, yeah. going one after the other. Uh, but yeah, that's basically what they started doing, serial killing. It kind of seemed like they didn't really plan to ever get away with all of this, that in the end they kind of knew eventually they would get caught. Um, I mean, how it's like pretty obvious that they were doing this eventually you're going to get arrested or found right you know like how long can you possibly keep this up it kind of seemed like they were on like a death mission anyway yeah it it does and that's that's like there's a lot of debate about what do you classify these two as do you classify them as serial killers or do you classify them as domestic terrorists Mm. Uh, especially once we get into the dc sniper shootings what about just mass murderers yeah yeah Yes, that would work. Yeah, that's kind of a nice blanket term for it. Yeah, so all the above. But let's go ahead and get into the DC sniper shootings. But before we do, we'd like to thank our last sponsors for today. I don't know about you, but I suffer from allergies. But one way that I battle those allergies is with my molecule. Now, molecule is reimagining the future of clean air, starting with the air purifier. And it's not just an innovation on existing technology that's out there but a scientific breakthrough in air purification. Molecule's core technology called PICO actually destroys harmful pollutants in the air like viruses, bacteria, mold, and chemicals instead of just collecting them on filters. This is great news, especially for me, because this helps eliminate some of the symptoms that allergies cause me. Not only that, during these uncertain times and with a pandemic going on, the molecule can actually help reduce the risk of exposure to COVID-19. So if you're interested in checking out Molecule, you can get 10% off your first air purifier order. Visit M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com and at checkout, enter mile higher. Again, for 10% off your first air purifier order, visit M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com and enter code mile higher at checkout. We all have something we're working on, perhaps a career change, finding a partner, or procrastinating less. The hard part isn't identifying these goals, it's taking action. Well, Talkspace Online Therapy is here to give you that support because that's all we need right now is more support. They'll match you with a licensed therapist from the comfort of your device and reach out 24-7 whenever something's on your mind. You'll hear back daily, five days a week. Thanks to Talkspace Online Therapy, finding a licensed therapist is easier than ever. Get matched with your perfect therapist right from your device and connect with them on your own schedule from anywhere at any time. Better yet, one month of Talkspace costs about the same amount as a single in-person therapy session. As a listener of the Mile Higher podcast, you can get $100 off your first month on Talkspace. To match with your perfect therapist, go to Talkspace.com or download the app and make sure to use the code MILEHIGHER to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com and enter code MILEHIGHER to get $100 off your first month. 
So John and Lee carried out the DC sniper shootings, or they're also called the Beltway sniper attacks in October of 2002. And this whole ordeal lasted a terrifying 22 days. And they terrorized everybody that lived in and around the DC area. And at the end of the day, they killed 10 people and injured three. At the time that all of this happens, John was 41 years old and Lee was only 17 years old. That's unbelievable how how different they were in age and yeah. they, I mean, he wasn't actually his father no. or related to him in any way. And f- I mean, what a weird relationship you can figure out pretty easily, you know, yeah. things were going on behind the scenes, which we'll get into later. Absolutely. Um, so because he was being majorly manipulated. Yeah. He's only 17. Yeah. It was like he groomed him to do yeah, this. Like he, he definitely groomed him, took advantage of this young kid and brainwashed him pretty much. And mm-hmm. yeah, made him into a terrorist. So the first incident happened around 5.20 p.m. on October 2nd in Aspen Hill, Maryland. A single bullet was shot through the front window of a Michael's Arts and Crafts store, almost hitting Ann Chapman, the cashier. Everyone inside the store was fine, and so Ann and the other employees assumed it was nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about? Yeah, what? What? A bullet comes flying through your store? I hope they at least called the police. No. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they did, but there was nothing to. You know, there's just a bullet that went through the glass. Like there could have been something going on outside. Like you know, yeah. Would you necessarily think it was a no. targeted attack? I mean, maybe on somebody. Though, it could have been. Well, a second shooting took place one hour later, just a few miles away from this Michaels. At 6:30, 55 year old James Martin, an accomplished program analyst at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration was just walking through the parking lot of Shoppers Food Warehouse in Wheaton, Maryland, when all of a sudden he was just shot and killed. Imagine that. You're just walking to your car after getting your groceries. You're all focused on getting to your car and everything, and then boom. Yeah. Just like it's always when these people are least expecting it. Yeah. It's just really scary. I mean. Oh, very. Especially for back then. Yeah, absolutely. So as you can imagine, like, you know, police are called, they go there, they try to save his life. They try to, you know, try to help this guy. I think actually some, a bystander actually went and started trying to help James. But unfortunately, I mean, this, this rifle that they're using is a Mm -hmm. deadly weapon. It's a weapon. I mean, they use it in war. Um, You know, the bullets that this thing shoots are specifically made to create, you know, once it enters, it enters a small hole, but then once it goes in, it expands out like this cone shape. So it basically just rips everything in its path apart. So then the exit wound is bigger. Well, usually there's no exit wound necessarily oh, really? because yeah, I mean it goes in and just completely tears everything apart. I remember with this one specifically though, he had yeah. exit and entrance wounds they yeah. were really big. Yeah. Really. So big. it would be bigger than the entrance wound. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if it came out the other side, then yeah, it would be a, a big old wound. So it's very hard to survive something like that because all of your inter- internal organs are going to be damaged by by this, but also just the sheer uh, amount of blood that James lost was, you know, probably one of the contributing factors to his death. The next day, five more people were gunned down and killed. First, a 39-year-old landscaper named James L. Buchanan, or Sonny, was mowing grass at the Fitzgerald Auto Malls in Rockville, Maryland, early that morning at 7.41 a.m., Sonny was shot and killed. And he was actually a police officer's son, too. So that really rocked their community. Less than an hour later, 54-year-old Prem Kumar Walkar stopped at a mobile gas station in Aspen Hill, Maryland. He was a part-time taxi driver, and he was just putting gas into his cab, minding his own business, when suddenly he was shot and killed instantly. Only 25 minutes later, the next victim was killed. That morning, 34-year-old Sarah Ramos had taken a bus to the Leisure World Shopping Center in Norbeck, Maryland. Sarah was a housekeeper and a nanny, and she decided to spend her free time relaxing on a bench with a good book. And at 8.37 a.m., she was shot and died at the scene. Yeah, so people were just literally minding their own business when all of a sudden they're just shot with this this rifle. They were looking for people who were distracted, who were doing other things, who weren't expecting it. I also just wanted to note that the different, you know, everything happens in the the DC area. So these are all suburbs of Washington DC where these attacks are happening. It's not like they're necessarily happening right at like the Lincoln Memorial. Cause I mean, for me, that's, I've never been to Washington DC. So when I think 
DC yeah. sniper shootings, I'm thinking this is happening like around the White House or something, mm-hmm. but that's mm-hmm. not not really the case. Yeah, it was in the area. So after Sarah Ramos was shot, witnesses told police that they saw two men in a white box truck with dark writing on the side driving away quickly from the shopping center. The media reported this detail and the police started stopping all vehicles that fit that description. Because at this point, things are getting very desperate. I mean, there's clearly, a yeah. um, you know, monster on the loose mm-hmm. that's just firing at will. So they need to catch this person as quickly as they can. And it doesn't it. seem like these people are connected. So yeah. it's not like they have a reason to go after yeah. all these specific people. It seems like it's totally random. Yeah. So anyone could be at risk. It's a huge risk to the community. I mean, there's kids walking around the community, kids at schools, and they were really freaked out that, you know, someone... I mean, more people would die. And unfortunately they did. Yeah. And just the fact that this is happening in such public places. Yes. Like how is somebody able to come kill somebody in plain Mm -hmm. sight where all these people are around and seemingly disappear or vanish? Mm -hmm. And that was like the biggest uh, mystery to police was like, what are we looking? We don't even know what we're looking for. Where is it coming from? Are they on a rooftop? Are they in a car? Are they in a tree? What's going on? So they had to go start looking at the actual victims of that were shot and actually start to figure out, you know, based upon the the wounds that they had, you can tell, you know, at what angle the bullet entered the body. So you could try to start, you know, eliminating potential places that, you know, somebody might be shooting from. So I think it was pretty clear from early on that it wasn't somebody from a high point that was shooting down at somebody or there was obviously no trees or anywhere really to hide. So it was like, what is somebody in a vehicle just shooting, run, driving around shooting people? That would be the only thing that would make sense. Right. So that's why when they got this tip about the white truck, they took it so seriously and they just literally started pulling over everybody with a, a white truck. I mean, it's desperate times. Like this isn't just someone on the run. This is someone who's actively yeah. shooting. So um, the next victim was 25 year old Lori and Lewis Rivera who decided to run some errands. She stopped at a Shell gas station in Kensington, Maryland to clean her Dodge Caravan. And at 9.58 a.m., Lori was using the vacuum station when she was suddenly shot and killed. Another person who's doing something else distracted never sees it coming. Yeah, and police were looking also at where are these people being killed at. And, you know, I think it was definitely kind of weird that it was like lots of gas stations, mm-hmm. lots of, of public stores. So it was just like, it, yeah, a real mystery um, at first. Almost 12 hours later, the last victim of the day was shot and killed. Pascal Charlot was a 72-year-old retired carpenter who was taking an evening stroll in Washington, D.C. He was on Georgia Avenue at Calmia Road when he was shot. He initially survived the shooting, but he died within the hour. What's crazy is that every single one of these victims we just uh, talked about was killed with a single bullet. And other than that, there was no pattern that police could really find. The location seemed completely random and all the shots were fired from a significant distance and no witnesses saw the shooter in the act. That's crazy. So that is to this day, barely any info to go off of. If you're the police trying to find who this, Mm -hmm. this person is, the police got a tip from an eyewitness to an earlier shooting in silver spring on September 14th. Someone saw a white box truck at the scene. However, after Pascal Charlotte was murdered in Washington, DC, Multiple witnesses reported seeing a blue Chevrolet Caprice. What's crazy is that later on, it was determined that police had actually stopped the Caprice owned by John Muhammad for a minor traffic violation just two hours before Pascal was shot. Also at this time, the police had theorized that the shooters had used a 223 caliber rifle, which is that Bushmaster rifle we talked about earlier. Word of the shooting spread very fast because media outlets throughout the region continued to pick up the story and the chief of police for Montgomery County, Maryland, Charles Moose, held a press conference about the shootings on October 3rd. The police issued a media alert for the dark blue Chevrolet Caprice and informed all surrounding police departments that this was the car they were looking for. Schools and parents were put on high alert, and many parents rushed to pull their kids out of school. Letting them walk home alone or take the bus was out of the question at this point. D.C. public schools, Montgomery County public schools, and local private schools kept the remaining students indoors at all times, and the buildings were all put on lockdown. Several neighboring school districts did the same thing. The police, though, as well as other law enforcement agencies, were starting to see a pattern with the sniper shootings at this point. What they realized when they kind of plotted everything out on a map is that all of the shootings were very close to major roadways. 
and that certain stores were consistent at these places. They also found out that the snipers were really familiar with the traffic patterns in the area. They made sure to go to the path of least resistance. So they always made sure that they were going with the flow of traffic versus against the flow. So like they made sure that after they did the shooting, that when they got on the highway to move out of the area, that they weren't going to jump into bumper to bumper traffic. Mm -hmm. So, because that was coming the other way. So they always followed the flow of traffic. So based on these movements, the police devised a scheme to try to trap the snipers. And this was called the concentric circle plan. An immediate response team was made ready to deploy within one minute of an emergency call. Police teams then created a trap consisting of a series of widening circles around the area. Roadblocks would be put in place everywhere with a goal of locking the snipers into a certain location. Unfortunately, though, the killer stayed one step ahead of police and slipped away after every shooting. And that's probably one of the craziest things about this is the fact that they Mm. were always able to be ahead of where the police were. And the police eventually got there within minutes. I mean, they were at these scenes right away. And do you think that was because they just weren't used to dealing with something like this? Like, do you think nowadays they would be able to catch them at each scene possibly or catch them faster than they did? Well, if you think about it for a second, I don't know if necessarily they could because the way that these guys are doing it in a vehicle like that, I don't see how in today's times it's gotten much better. Like if you knew the flows of traffic and you knew, you know, you had it all planned out real well, Mm-hmm. I feel like you could probably still, you know, send people on a chase for quite a while. I think it'd be harder, obviously, because of, you know, cell phone paint, you know, mm-hmm. every, well, I guess they had that kind of stuff too, but just, I think people are more trackable now. Yeah. And I think the public is just more aware and like, you or know, can film it on their smartphone. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like somebody would see something yeah. nowadays and record it, you know, get it to the police quicker. And for, can't you text the police? Can you text them files like pictures and stuff now? I know you can text them for emergencies, but uh, possibly on one huh. possibly. I mean, I'm sure there's tip lines that you could do that for. Yeah. And like here, like, you know, this was the early 2000s. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, technology was still, you know, developing. It was, you know, Every, yeah. People like flip phones and stuff. Internet's pretty fresh. So, mm-hmm. you know, they didn't have all those capabilities, GPS tracking and all of that on, mm-hmm. on phones and things like that or cell phones. So, and they don't know who it is. So that's really no use to them anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they were, they were really hard to catch. But one of the things that really did help law enforcement was that they opened up tip lines and they followed up on any credible information that they received from the public. They even investigated a tip that came from South Bethany, Delaware, a town with just over 500 residents that a suspicious vehicle had been spotted. Allegedly, John and Lee called the tip lines themselves at least six times. Damn. But like they couldn't get through. There was that many people calling the tip lines. It was mm-hmm. uh, pretty overwhelming. The ATF or the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, the FBI, U.S. Secret Service and Virginia Department of Transportation also assisted with the investigation. So, that I mean, they brought out everybody for this. I mean, at this point, this is an emergency. They got to get as many resources involved as possible. So when, you know, when the calls came in for the shooting, they were on scene within minutes uh, and they closed all the surrounding roads, inspected every vehicle. They'd stop traffic for hours at a time. But the shootings continued on October 4th. That afternoon, 43-year-old Caroline Sewell, a homemaker, decided to take a trip to Spotsylvania Mall. Spotsylvania? Yeah, Spotsylvania. Never heard of that. That's interesting. In Virginia. She went shopping at Michael's and then headed out to her minivan with her full shopping bags. And at 2.30 p.m., as she was putting her bags into her van, she was shot in the chest. It's so mind-blowing to think she was just innocently buying craft supplies. Yeah, the fuck seriously but fortunately she survived uh, her injuries and after the shooting a witness told police they saw a gray car leaving the scene one of the big things with this case is was the media coverage i mean the media was covering this 24 7 they were constantly talking about it constantly i mean constantly keeping people updated the radio yeah, you have to you know because things are happening you know in real time and shootings are happening all the time every day so people needed to be aware of what was going on and police who were working the case actually said it was hurting their investigation that there was so much media coverage about it because obviously they're trying to stay somewhat stealthy. It was also the night of October 4th that the police were able to use forensic evidence in order to link all of the October 2nd and October 3rd shootings to the same gun. After that, a few days passed without incident. Then at 8.09 a.m. on the morning of October 7th, 
Tanya Brown, a nurse, dropped her nephew off at school. While 13-year-old Iran Brown was walking toward Benjamin Tasker Middle School in Bowie, Maryland, he was shot in the chest. The bullet ripped through several major organs, critically injuring him. And luckily, Tanya heard the shot as she was driving away, turned around and saw that he had been shot and was able to rush around to the hospital where he needed emergency surgery. And that's, and, a, that's luck right there. And after a, a ton of surgery, he did survive, luckily. It's amazing. But this was like the first time that a, a child had been shot, too. Mm-hmm. They No children had been shot prior to Iran. So it, well, it, it almost seems the, like a yeah sign that mm-hmm. they're not scared and that they're going to step this up yeah. and start just shooting children now. Yeah, they're not worried. They're not you know picking and choosing. They're going to kill anyone. Yeah. Now, this is really interesting. So when the police processed this crime scene, they found a death tarot card. And on the front of the card, someone had written, call me God. And on the back three lines said for you, Mr. Police code, call me God. Do not release to the press. I think it's really interesting that they used a tarot card and I wonder why. Yeah. Cause like, here's the depiction of, of the card, uh, for those that don't know. So the death card usually depicts a skeleton, sometimes riding a horse, but more often wielding a sickle. Surrounding it are dead and dying people from all classes, including kings, bishops, and commoners. Now, as for the meaning, it's unlikely that this card actually represents a physical death. Typically, it implies an end, possibly of a relationship or interest, and therefore implies an increased sense of self-awareness. So that's what's weird about is maybe these guys didn't know what the meaning of the card was and they just saw death on it and they wanted to use it. That's quite possible as a calling card, which I mean, I wonder if they did have any more knowledge about it. And if any of you have more understanding of tarot cards, then let us know what you think. Yeah. I looked at it. They use that. Yeah. I looked at several different interpretations of it and they're all, none of them said that this represents physical death necessarily. Just wanted to, it's just death in general. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. While combing the scene, they also found a shell casings. And investigators decided to withhold the information about the tarot card from the public as key evidence. However, just one day later, a local station and the Washington Post had all the details about the crime scene, and they leaked to the public uh, the information about the death tarot card. And the media actually misquoted the line on the card as, I am God, instead of call me God. So the police really didn't want this information to get out. And of course, as, as it happens in a lot of cases, somehow this information leaks to the media and then the media puts it out to the public because they wanted to kind of keep this in their back pocket. So, you know, because it did say that do not give it to the press. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can open communication with the snipers. If they follow the orders. Right. Yeah. Maybe they could actually get somewhere with this, but unfortunately that got thrown out the window real quick. So then on the evening of October 9th, 53 year old Dean Harold Myers, a civil engineer pulled into the Seneca gas station in Prince William County, Virginia at 8, 18 PM. He was shot and killed while pumping gas. Another gas station. Yep. Police officers in Baltimore investigated a dark blue Chevrolet Caprice on October 8th. And it was near the Jones falls expressway with someone asleep inside. The officers questioned the driver and took his license and the car fit the description from pretty much all the DC sniper shootings. And while they're suspicious that the car was registered in New Jersey, but the driver's license was from Washington state, they ultimately didn't search the car and let the person go without further questioning. So that's, that's weird. Yeah. But then unfortunately on the morning of October 11th, Kenneth bridges, a 53 year old businessman was pumping gas about 50 miles from where Dean was shot at an Exxon station in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. He was shot and killed at 9.30 a.m. A few days later, on October 14th, 47-year-old Linda Franklin, an FBI intelligence analyst, drove to the Home Depot in Fairfax County, Virginia, and parked her car in a covered parking lot. It was there that she was then shot and killed in that same parking lot at 9.15 p.m. So she was literally shot while she was at Home Depot. That's so scary. From uh, quite a distance away, just like all the other shootings. And after the shooting, the police thought that they caught a break. A man named Matthew Doughty came forward as a witness to the shooting. However, the police soon learned that Matthew was inside the Home Depot when Linda was killed and had made everything up. Why do people do that? Why do people make up that they were like somehow connected to it? I guess to feel special. It happens a lot. 
happens more often than you'd think. Yeah. Don't people know that's a crime? Like you can't, you can be charged with interfering with an investigation, which is what happened to Matthew. Just seems like really stupid to do that. It is really stupid. I don't know why people do it. Yeah. It's really bizarre. I, I don't guess know. for attention. Yeah. That's the kind of attention you want. <laughs> I know like, it really doesn't make any sense. But after the shooting, John and Lee then took a five day break. At this point, people were terrified to linger in parking lots or stand still while pumping gas. They either paced back and forth while their tanks filled or laid down in their back seats. It seemed that everyone was darting around their cars and looking over their shoulders, waiting to be hit with a random bullet. Can that you would imagine? be so scary. Like right now, I would I'm, not leave the house. I don't care. Yeah. I would call out of my job, anything. I'd be like, fuck it. I am not leaving this house. Seriously. Until they catch this person. What the fuck? That is so scary. Yeah. And people, yeah, people were doing all those things. Like mm -hmm. I know from some of the news clips that I've seen, like people were describing like what they would do or if they had their kid in the car while they're pumping gas, they make them lay on the floorboards and like, damn, it was like serious. Like they'd run. If you'd leave a building, you'd run to your vehicle or go behind your vehicle. And yeah, people were always looking over, like constantly looking around. Cause I mean, they just had no idea where a bullet might come from. So scary. So apparently a woman named Lisa Notgrass, who lived in Lake Jackson, Texas, obsessively called national media outlets demanding something be done. In response, gas stations started putting up tarps around the gas pumps so their customers couldn't be seen and would feel safer. I mean, I, I like guess you would. I would feel a lot safer because then someone would, can't aim and like hit you. I guess they could still shoot at it, but. I wonder if the tarps went all the way to the ground or if like people, you could see their feet or oh, something. It's like. so weird to think about. I don't really see how that helps a whole lot because mm -mm. aren't they can't hide the car. No. So if you see a car there and somebody gets out of the car and even if they're behind a tarp, I mean, somebody could shoot at the tarp still. Yeah. Plus what if you're just like standing on top of a tall building and looking over the tarp? Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. fuck? I don't see why. I, I guess it's just the pressure. Like they had to do something and like mm -hmm. people are freaking out. So how can we improve it? If there's yeah. anything we can do. Damn. The least we can do is put a tarp up for you. Try to hide you. But people would even drive to the naval base in Bethesda, Maryland to get gas because it was a government building surrounded by a guarded fence. And by this point, news outlets cross country were covering the shootings. News crews had cameras and reporters on every scene for hours on end, speculating about the identity of the DC sniper shooters and filming the police as they search for evidence. Man, I can't even imagine what the news coverage would be like in today of today's times if that happens like that'd be crazy oh, it would be a big drama yeah thing. it would be i mean it, i'm sure it was back then too but even more so now they really play up everything like this now they really do and even back then it didn't stop journalists from making things up mm -hmm. and uh misreporting things mm -hmm. they all want to get the juicy details first yep they do everyone's so freaked out and have their eyes glued to the media and they want to take advantage of that absolutely this even uh, made it to America's Most Wanted. They covered the shootings for an entire episode to hopefully try to generate more tips from the public because that's really what the police, the police didn't have a lot of information and it really came down to like pleading with the public. Like if you see anything or you think yeah. you may know anything, please, please let us know anything. Mm -hmm. If they had at least something to work off of, make yeah. a huge difference. That's all they had to go off of. There's like little physical evidence at any of the shooting scenes. I mean, they found a few casings. They, they knew they pretty much knew what kind of rifle it was, but they still had that no clue help you. who the identity of, of the person was. Mm -hmm. Now this is really crazy. So as a result of, you know, the police asking for tips and, you know, the news coverage and America was most wanted, they got bombarded with over a hundred thousand tips. They said, uh, which is just astronomical. I mean that you have to go through every tip and, and, and figure out if it's something you know you can follow up on and actually look into but what's crazy is that a man by the name robert holmes tried to call in a tip mm -hmm. and he was a longtime friend of john muhammad and he knew they were in the army together and he knew that this guy is the guy yeah pretty much he knew he had the gun he knew uh, that he was in dc looking for his wife mildred and that yeah, he, he would, knew the motive everything all of it and, and he, he called with it. To he the called tip line. in with the yeah, and yeah. they lost it. That's they got wild. lost. How do you lose something like that? You'd think you'd get that right to the people at the top, but I mean, the problem is there was a lot of fake tips coming in. So yeah. It was confusing. Well, and and at the time, I mean, it's calling in on a phone mm -hmm. too, and like you got to think like the technology was probably not as good as capturing the information. It was all manual. It's all mm -hmm. you know, 
there's mistakes that are being made by people that are working the tip lines. I mean, they're like a phone bank. And so it, mm-hmm. I guess it's possible, but it's of course unfortunate that it happened to be like the one tip they really needed uh, got lost. But other callers were also trying to take credit for the murders, which complicated the investigation. And ironically, the snipers even wanted to talk to the task force at one point, but also had trouble getting through. Yeah, Lee actually called the dispatch and talked to the woman on the phone. And he started telling her, we did this. You know, we're the ones who are out killing people. But he was kind of talking like you can't hear it super well. And he's a little bit mumbling. So she sounds like she starts thinking it's a prank or something and just goes, well, sorry, sir. Do you want me to connect you to, we're not the ones investigating this. Do you want me to connect you to a different line yeah, or whatever? Right, or and like he just the, like hung up. Yeah. He's like, what the fuck? And hung up. He just confessed. He was going to like tell her where they were and turn themselves in. And they just missed it because the dispatcher thought they were full of shit and hung up on them. Well, it was probably hard to discern that. I mean, you have no way to know if this person is legit or not. So, you know, yeah. and it's not really the dispatch's job to like figure that out. So that's what she was saying is like, got to get it over to people who follow up on whatever your tip or whatever it is. But, but if but, someone is saying we're the ones who did it, you think you'd be like, hold on, sir, let me get you to the right people. Yeah, I guess she, she almost her attitude towards him after that. I don't know. I just think you would take that more seriously. If someone's straight up saying I did it, Unless I guess that many people were claiming to do it, which why would all these people do that? People do crazy things, man. And this was nationwide now, probably worldwide at this point. So like, Like, why would you want that? (laughs) I don't know. I don't get people. Yeah. Well, even the criminal profilers were also having major issues uh, trying to figure out who was behind this. They actually predicted that the sniper was most likely a white male. And that assumption was based largely on the characteristics of past serial killers. So on October 17th, Investigators were able to match two fingerprints found at two separate crime scenes, the Montgomery liquor store and Benjamin Tasker middle school. They identified the print as belonging to Lee Boyd Malvo and further investigation revealed Lee's close relationship with John Allen Muhammad. Now, as soon as they identified the suspects, this broke the case wide open. However, the public was still kept mostly in the dark about the progress in the case. The police quickly uncovered details about John's turbulent relationship with his ex-wife, Mildred Green, as well as the restraining order she had against him. By that time, she lived in Prince George's County with her three kids right next to Montgomery County, Maryland. The police also found records of a car John had bought in New Jersey, a 1990 Chevrolet Caprice that had been used as an undercover police car in Bordentown, New Jersey. Investigators found the license plate number and discovered the car had been checked by radio patrol cars around multiple shooting sites, but was never flagged as suspicious. There was no criminal record connected to it, and it didn't fit the description of a white van or truck. That's just crazy that like they let it slip through their fingers. Mm-hmm. They had they potentially had him way earlier, but because they at the time were looking for a white van or truck, they just let it go. Mm-hmm. The next shooting took place on the evening of October 19th. Around 8 p.m., 37-year-old Jeffrey Hopper and his wife Stephanie were walking through a parking lot in Ashland, Virginia, near a Ponderosa Steakhouse when Jeffrey was shot. Stephanie screamed for help, and someone who was walking by called 911. Jeffrey was rushed to the hospital and survived. When the police arrived on the scene and searched around, they found a four-page letter wrapped in plastic and tacked to a tree in the woods near the parking lot. It was allegedly from the shooter. And in the letter, John and Lee wrote, For you, Mr. Police, call me God. Do not release to the press. Repeating the same phrase the police found on the tarot card. Call me God. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Hmm. They also demanded $10 million and provided the account number and PIN for the Bank of America Platinum credit card, which they had stolen prior from a Greyhound bus driver in Arizona months before. They said, we will have unlimited withdrawal at any ATM worldwide. What? Why did they think that? Because they got a bus driver's yeah, credit I guess, card? Yeah, I guess because it's a Bank of America card. <laughs> what? Idiots. Yeah. They went on to talk about the tip lines that the police had set up, which they had called themselves, and said that the operators were incompetent and only took the calls for a hoax or a joke. And they even referenced some of the operators by name. But as the letter went on, each line was more disturbing than the last. It read, your failure to respond has cost you five lives. If stopping the killing is more important than catching us now, then you will accept our demand, which are non-negotiable. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. 
The last line of the letter was written awkwardly, but authorities theorized it was rooted in Jamaican reggae music. It said, you will have less body bags. If trying to catch us now more important than before, you body bags, word is bond. And at a press briefing, Chief Moose actually spoke directly to the shooters vowing to find them and said, our word is our bond. After the public learned about the letter and the threats made directly to children, school systems and parents were even more on edge. More activities were canceled. School started requiring parents to pick up their kids after school so no one was walking outside. Police officers were placed at schools for added security. And parents were even asked to stand guard outside of some school buildings. That would be a scary job. Yeah, seriously. Damn. Why not just cancel school? Yeah, I know. On October 20th, the police compared two phone calls. One was to the tip line of the Rockville police, and the other was a confession from the alleged sniper to a priest where the caller implied they had murdered someone at a liquor store in Alabama. On October 21st, John or Lee called a police tip line again from a payphone at an Exxon station in Glen Allen, Virginia, and bragged about their crimes, including the September 21st shooting at the liquor store in Montgomery, Alabama. And the police were actually able to trace the call, but unfortunately, they got there too late. And they ended up arresting two people that were there that were in a a, a white truck, but they were completely unrelated to the sniper shootings. Early the next morning on October 22nd, Conrad Johnson, a 35-year-old bus driver in Aspen Hill, Maryland, was standing on the steps of his bus just cleaning it out when he was shot at 5.56 a.m. He initially looked like he was going to survive, but he later died from his injuries. On October 23rd, ballistics evidence revealed that Conrad Johnson was the 10th person murdered by the shooters that month. On the same day, the police used metal detectors to find a tree stump in Tacoma, Washington that they believed the shooters had used to practice shooting. They removed that tree stump and took it in as evidence. At that point, investigators issued a bolo for John Lee and the Chevrolet Caprice and faxed a picture of John to the sniper task force. At almost midnight on October 23rd, 2002, Police Chief Moose passed a message along to the snipers through the media following their directions. At the press conference, he said, You have indicated that you want us to do and say certain things. You have asked us to say, We have caught the sniper like a duck in a noose. We understand that hearing us say this is important to you. At around 12.54 a.m., a woman named Whitney Donahue called the police about a suspicious car at a rest stop in Myersville, Maryland off Interstate 70. Trooper First Class D. Wayne Smith responded to the call, and realizing the car fit the description for the shooters, he immediately jumped into action and blocked the main exit with his unmarked police car and called for backup. So smart. Inside of the vehicle was John and Lee sleeping away. At this point, the police were trying to figure out what their plan of attack was to go and arrest these two. They went ahead and blocked all possible escape routes and used the tractor trailer of a truck driver to completely seal off the main exit. They wanted to make absolutely sure that they got these guys into custody. They even brought in the SWAT team, which swooped in and arrested John and Lee at 3.15 a.m. on October 24th. Without incident, too, because, I mean, they thought Mm -hmm. whoever these snipers are will probably have a shootout with them at some point, but nope, they got them while they were sleeping. And when investigators searched the car, they found the stolen Bushmaster XM-15 and a bipod, which is used to increase accuracy while firing weapons in a full automatic mode. The police also found the laptop John and Lee had stolen from Paul LaRuffa. And in the trunk of the car, they found that it had been modified to serve as a makeshift sniper's nest. That's scary to think about. Yeah, like they drilled holes into the car so that he could just stick his gun out. Yeah, and they they drilled two holes so that the scope could uh, fit in there as well. Mm -hmm. So that they could, yeah, look through the scope when they would uh, shoot people. That's crazy. They also noticed that the car had darker than normal tinting on the back windows and the firewall between the trunk and the rear seat had been removed and the back seat could fold down, which would enable a potential shooter to stretch out in the back without stepping a foot outside. So they literally would were shooting people from inside the back of this car. The rifle that they recovered also had a holographic sight on it as well, which allow for accurate shooting from a distance of 984 feet. So that's how They were able to shoot from so far away. I have no idea what that means. It's just basically the scope has a sight on it that allows you to be able to see very far away up close. Why is it called holographic? Because it have like a a little, uh, what is it called? A a ridicule in it, like a little thing, uh, either an X 
or oh, a cross. Like so, crosshairs? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you'd have that, but it's oh. like a holographic looking oh, okay. thing gotcha. that is built into the scope. Sorry, I don't know anything about guns. It's all right. So they pretty much made a killing machine. One would be in the driver's seat ready to take off after the shooting and while the other was in the back. Yeah, yeah. No one would see them and know that it was that car. Right. You wouldn't see anything because literally the bull is coming out of the back of the vehicle. That's wild. So this was clearly premeditated and very well planned. So obviously these shootings were done in several different states. So the states kind of had to debate with the federal government about what charges should be filed and in what order. On October 25th, prosecutors in Montgomery, Maryland, announced their plan to pursue six first-degree murder charges and seek the death penalty for John. On October 29th, capital murder charges against John and Lee were filed by prosecutors in Virginia. These are the two states that John and Lee stood trial in. So it didn't take long for investigators to kind of figure out that the motive for these shootings were for John to be able to murder his ex-wife, Mildred Green, so that he wouldn't be suspected because police would believe that maybe this is just a big serial killer and she just happens to be one of the victims. Like she was a random victim. Right. Which would make sense to some extent. Like this theory clearly has some. Yeah, I see where he was going with that. Evidence there because obviously he was pissed that she took his kids away from him. And, you know, some of the shootings did take place close to uh, her neighborhood and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, why didn't they, why didn't they do this then? Why didn't they go right after her? Like if you're going to go do this whole thing to kill your wife, why wouldn't you make sure that maybe they're planning down the road? Like how many did it, were they planning to kill before they killed Mildred? I mean, I don't know how long they were planning on this going on. I don't know if the end result was supposed to be them getting caught. And like I said earlier, they already had planned on that and they knew that this was a death mission, but it seems like there's a chance that they really did think they were going to get away and just stage it as this serial killer thing. And then, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I I'm not fully in on that theory. I, I think it's interesting, but I feel mm-hmm. like if that were the case and they would have made sure they got Mildred. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. I like, mean, why unless they were going to do that eventually though, yeah. and they got caught before they, that's thought true. They would. It's possible. But even the judge uh, presiding over their case determined that there wasn't enough evidence for them to even present that theory at the trial. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that while in prison, Lee wrote what he called jihad against the United States, saying things like, I have been accused on my mission. Allah knows I'm going to suffer now. His writings and drawings included ideas from real people like Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and fictional characters like those in the movie The Matrix. And they were ultimately dismissed as evidence. But I think that's evidence right there that this was about more than just yeah. a murder plot to kill. Mildred. Definitely. But did he want to kill her in the process? Is that why he yeah. picked the area? Right. Hoping that he could maybe True. kill her on his way out. You know? Yeah. We're going to go on this jihad mm-hmm. mission, but in the process, we're also going to kill my ex-wife because I right. just, I want my kids back. I think it's possible because of the area that they were in that yeah. he was there for Mildred, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. So. And while John and Lee were awaiting trial, former police chief Moose published a book about the investigation and went on a huge media tour. People were really interested in this case, obviously all across the country. And he appeared on programs such as the tonight show, Dateline NBC, the today show. And he received harsh criticism from other officers for potentially damaging the case by talking about it so much. Which I I do think it's a little weird that he went on a book tour uh, for this. Like it doesn't seem like the appropriate thing to do, but Mm-mm. I don't know. I don't know. I guess people would have different opinions. Why on not? Yeah. yeah. John and Lee were put on trial in Virginia in 2003 and the trials were held in cities far away from the shooting sites. The defense argued that this was necessary to find jurors who had not been compromised by the media reports and chief Moose's book tour. Which I, I guess that makes sense. Cause mm-hmm. yeah, if he's out there spreading all the information out there, it's going to be harder to find jurors. I don't know anything about this for sure. And this is a case where Lee, you know, was only 17 years old and he was tried as an adult, like we were talking about earlier, uh, for the murder of Linda Franklin in Chesapeake, Virginia. At this time, the judge ruled that he could receive the death penalty, even though he had committed a murder when he was a minor. So I'm sure people have different opinions on that. Let us know what you think about that. During the trial, Lee claimed that he had pulled the trigger for every murder and tried to use insanity as a defense. But he was found guilty of capital murder, use of a firearm, and terrorism on December 18th, 2003, and was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole on March 10th, 2004. Lee accepted a plea bargain for the murders of Kenneth Bridges and attempted murder of Caroline Sewell. 
and again was sentenced to life without parole. The plea bargain took the death penalty off the table. John's trial took place in Virginia Beach. And at the trial, Iran Brown testified telling the court in chilling detail about being shot outside his middle school when he was just 13 years old and only surviving because his aunt rushed him to the emergency room. John was found guilty of capital murder for the death of Dean Myers on November 17, 2003, and he was sentenced to death on November 24th. In 2006, Lee accepted another plea deal in Maryland. He confessed to six shootings in Montgomery County and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And part of this plea deal was that he had to testify against John at his Montgomery County trial. Lee testified for the prosecution at John's trial on May 23, 2006, after receiving extensive psychological counsel. During his testimony, he confessed to being involved in all 17 murders, but admitted to lying during the Virginia trial when he claimed he had pulled the trigger every time. He said he lied to try to save John from the death penalty. I mean, that's how groomed he was by John. Yeah, he, he was, was willing very to, loyal to him. Yeah, lie for him for sure. It was at this point that he came out and said that John was the shooter in the first six attacks. Lee also laid out the details of John's three phase plan for the shootings. During the first phase, they planned to kill six white people every day for 30 days. In phase two, they planned to kill a pregnant woman and a police officer. Then they wanted to detonate explosive devices at the officer's funeral to kill more police. Wow. In the third phase, they planned to extort millions of dollars from the government to start the Canadian camp for homeless boys. John wanted to train these boys to commit more mass shootings in the United States and recreate the chaos felt throughout the country after 9-11. John's legal team tried several tactics to prevent the death sentence from being carried out. They even petitioned the Supreme Court, and when that didn't work, they went to the Virginia governor, Tim Kaine. All of their efforts failed. Go so like Kane. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. John was executed by lethal injection on November 10, 2009 at the Greensville Correctional Center in Virginia. 27 witnesses were present, including family members of his victims. He was asked if he had any last words, but he did not answer. The execution began at 9.06 p.m., and he was dead within five minutes. At a press conference after John's death, his family said they had a letter from him that they weren't ready to disclose. But after John was executed, Lee has since come out and said multiple things since then. In July of 2010, Lee said during an interview that he killed more than 40 people across the country with other accomplices. Also, he started saying that he was in a very abusive relationship with John. It seemed like almost after John had died, he felt free to say what he really meant. And he said that he had been sexually abused as a child by a babysitter and that he was also sexually abused by John throughout their relationship, which does not surprise me. I mean, I guess we have no way to verify that, but yeah. chances are. It's probably true. Mm -hmm. When talking about the shootings and his relationship with John, Lee said, I couldn't say no. I wanted that level of love and acceptance and consistency for all my life, and I couldn't find it. And even if unconsciously or even in moments of short reflection, I knew it was wrong. I did not have the willpower to say no. Lee explained that at the time he was already dead to an extent and he feared letting down John more than death. I couldn't say no. I had wanted that level of love and acceptance and consistency for all of my life and couldn't find it. And even if unconsciously or even in moments of short reflection, I knew that it was wrong. I did not have the willpower to say no. I mean, because at that, at that point in time, to a certain extent, I was already dead. And that death per se is not what I feared, what I feared the most. I feared letting him down more than I feared death. Earlier on, around the age of six, I was, I was almost five years old. I would say I was sexually abused by a um, babysitter. And then later on by relatives when I was eight, nine years old. And then for the entire period when I was almost 15 until I got arrested, I was sexually abused by John Muhammad. I would share with them what I've used for myself. Please do not allow my actions and the actions of Muhammad to hold you hostage and continue to victimize you for the rest of your life. If you give those images and thoughts that power, it will continue to inflict that suffering over and over and over and over and over again. 
at, you do not give me or him that much power. I think the key thing from that though, is that he does show remorse. Lee did show remorse. He actually wrote some of the victims apology letters, even to the wow. families yeah. um, after all this was over. I mean, it is so much easier to become, you know, controlled like that and abused when you're younger and right. tricked into doing things. And right. Yeah, I'm sure he's realized a lot since everything happened. Yeah, absolutely. On July 25th, 2012, the Supreme court ruled that someone cannot receive the life sentence without possibility of parole for a crime that was committed while they were a minor. In June of 2013, Lee's legal team had asked Virginia and Maryland to overturn these life sentences. And in 2017, the Supreme Court clarified their ruling, stating that life without parole should only be given to the rare juvenile offender whose crime reflects irreparable corruption. Which, honestly, this kind of fits that, I feel like. I do, too. I mean, I can see that for sure. Like, I don't know if I'm he should have his, people's opinions on that. his sentence overturned. I don't know if he should have either. But they took the case all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which heard arguments on October 16th, 2019. The ruling was expected in the summer of 2020, actually, but Lee withdrew the case in February. And this is really interesting and strange. But the following month, Lee ended up marrying a 30-year-old wealthy heiress named Sable Noel Knapp. They had a small ceremony at Red Onion State Prison, a supermax prison in southwest Virginia. And Sable is actually an activist who has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to liberal politicians and causes. They did create two memorial sites dedicated to the victims of the deep sea sniper shooting. The reflection terrace at Brookside gardens in Wheaton, Maryland was built in 2004. And then 10 years later, a second memorial was built in the government plaza of Rockville, Maryland, which I'm glad that they did that. Cause yeah. this, this event definitely needs a memorial. I'm surprised that there's not more documentaries or content or like a Netflix special on this. Well, yeah. And that, that was kind of weird to me too. When, when kind of researching for this is that there's, there's like some British documentaries. I feel like the, yeah. the British always covered this kind of stuff for some yeah. reason, probably cause it's so wild to them over there. But mm-hmm. uh, vice is working on one. Actually, I think they're working directly with Lee called I sniper. Interesting. Um, it's not out yet, but I think he's done interviews. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's directly with him and he's going to tell the whole thing from his, wow. his perspective. That's going to be um, interesting. I'm sure the two of them did some shit, just got into so much. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot to go Oh, over. I'm sure there's way more too. I mean, this is just such a huge, huge case from mm, start to finish. Mm-hmm. I mean, the amount of different people involved, the amount of victims, and and he's saying there's 40, you know, 40 yeah. different deaths and this guy was other a accomplices. Killer. Yeah. 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 They they really were. And I know there there is a podcast that covered this uh, in great detail called DC sniper or something. I think tenderfoot, same people did culpable. I think did it maybe. Oh really? Yeah. I'm oh, pretty cool. sure it was uh, those guys, uh, that same production company that did a mm-hmm. big long thing. Cause I mean, you could easily draw this out into yeah, like a whole show j- all about this and each really victim and I yeah, mean, so much time that they spent together and how they started working together. Yeah. It's really an interesting one. I'm surprised that more people don't really know about it or the details behind it at least. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, does Lee deserve to be in prison uh, for life? I mean, I think he deserves to be in prison for life. I, I don't know. It's it's hard. I do see the argument. He's sorry. He's shown, you know, okay, he wants to. Okay, but just to, because you're sorry. I yeah, mean, no, I know. It doesn't take back everything you did. But at the same time, he was being abused by someone who's so much older than him. He was a minor. And, I mean, who knows how bad it actually was. I don't know. I think people have really mixed opinions on that. I really want to know what other people think um, because some people will look at it like, you know, you're 17 years old. You should know better either way. You knew it was wrong. You did it anyway. And at the end of the day, people died because of you. So justice a is A lot served. of people died. Yeah, a lot of people died. This was a serious, serious event. So and, I don't and know. I, mean, I think life in prison is honestly warranted, yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, or just a very, very long sentence, you know, yeah. 30, 50 years. I don't know. I don't know if your entire life, but yeah, maybe not. I mean, it's hard to say because I mean, that's a, lot a long of people time. People died though. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, they did execute John. So, yeah. you know, there's that they got, they got some form of justice there for sure. Mm-hmm. But does that, you know, it, it's, it's very yeah. controversial, you know, know it's debatable. Yeah. I mean, everybody I feels differently sides for sure. 
Yeah. So definitely let us know what you think about this. Uh, we definitely want to hear, but we'll go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode of the Malhar podcast. If you did make sure you guys go on iTunes and subscribe and go to Spotify and follow. Even if you only watch the show on YouTube, it does really help us out. It makes a big difference. For makes us. a big difference because uh, unfortunately those YouTube numbers do not matter uh, in the podcasting <laughs> world still. So hopefully that'll change somewhere down the road, but we would really appreciate if you guys went and did that. But yeah, until next time, stay safe and stay woke.